Right, well, we've only met recently, so we better introduce ourselves yeah. again. Yeah. So I'm Thank Hugh, you. I'm an intensive care consultant at the Whittington Hospital, okay. um, and I've been here for ages, <laughs> uh, years and years and years. And remind me who you are, what you do for a living. So my name's Jenny Wilson, I'm a professor in healthcare epidemiology at the University of West London, but I've actually worked in infection prevention and control for around about 35 years. I'm Vice President of the Infection Prevention uh, Society, and I'm also an honorary uh, infection control nurse here at Whittington Health. So you know quite a lot about this then, I'm guessing? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, what I thought I might, might be helpful is to have a chat, because there's a lot of anxiety about PPE. Mm -hmm. We hear lots of terror in the press. Uh -huh. We have lots of anxiety as things have changed over recent weeks and months. It might be a nice time just to take a bit of stock, think about what we're doing now, work out what's best, and whether we have to sweat it at all. So, if you don't mind, can I grill you? Yeah. Excellent. Let's start with the easy one then. Um, I work in intensive care mm -hmm. and we started off, I think, because of Ebola days, everyone was wearing gloves, taped on, usually double gloves, FFP3 masks, visors, goggles, waterproof gowns. Yeah. Is that all necessary? Is this a high risk zone? Are we actually a high risk working in an intensive yeah. care unit? So certainly at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, um, it, you would designate an ICU as a high risk area. But the reason it's high risk is mm. because you are doing regular aerosol generating procedures. So procedures that, that you do on a patient that involve deep into the respiratory tract and that has a tendency to release these tiny little droplet nuclei. Right. So those aren't normally released by normal conversation or sure. coughing or sneezing. But as soon as you start uh, intubating or tracheostomies, then there is a danger that you release these small droplet nuclei. Right. Now, in the early days of the COVID outbreak, you may have had quite a lot of patients in ICU who were perhaps having CPAP or yep. BiPAP. Procedures like that where they generate um, more of these aerosols, uh, droplet yeah. nuclei aerosols. But of course, as the outbreak's gone on, and now you tend to have patients in intensive care who are just having mechanical ventilation and the number of aerosol generating procedures that you're doing in that environment is much, much reduced. And so whilst it, it remains a high risk area, it's not the same as it was at the beginning of the outbreak where you were doing regular aerosol generating procedures. And ideally what we need to try and do is look at doing procedures that are aerosol generating like intubation or extubation in a side room or a single room so that just those people who are directly involved in that AGP can wear the protective clothing that they need to stop them inhaling these droplet nuclei. Right, so I've got an intubated patient on a closed mm -hmm. circuit yeah. and I'm not suggesting anyone does this but presumably <laughs> I could walk up in swimming trunks with nothing else on and stand next to the patient. Yeah. My chance of contracting yeah. coronavirus from yeah. them from that uh, would be very, very small indeed. Absolutely, because they're not, they're intubated, they've got a closed airway, so they're not generating those tiny little droplet nuclei. And bear in mind that the only two ways that you're going to get COVID-19 are right. that you inhale it, um, but you need a, a tiny particle to be able to inhale it, or you get splashes, droplets onto your mucous membranes. Now those can land directly on your mucous membranes if the patient is coughing and spluttering right. um, and is not mechanically ventilated, but also by touching. So if you touched that patient's bed area, there may be a few virus particles there. And then if you touched your own mucous membranes, right. you would transfer it on your hands and that is the other way that you might acquire the infection. And it makes sense, doesn't it, for us just to make an assumption that everything we touch in an area like that, or actually yeah. even in here, we're in a lecture theatre for reasons yeah. of keeping social yeah. distancing, but even here, it makes sense. Just assume everything we're touching has got yeah. coronavirus on it, yeah. okay. But as you say, if, as long as I don't rub my eyes, yeah. and I don't suck my fingers, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what about then, and as long as I'm not doing an aerosol generating procedure, mm -hmm. I'm fine. What about then if I am wearing my mask, because I'm in a confined area of 18 beds, and I've got my goggles, mm -hmm. which I tend to wear even away from the bed space, because it stops me sticking my finger in the mouth <laughs> yes, above my eyes. that's very true. But um, if I'm next to the patient, do I have to worry about a ventilator disconnection? I mean, everyone's worried saying, yeah. Something yeah. comes, is that yeah. a risk, is that aerosol generating? Well, of course, you will see an aerosol when that happens, won't you? You often see a big shoot of, of, stuff. of stuff. But the aerosol comes from the ventilator, not the patient. So the ventilator side is just filtered. It's filtered humidified air. So it looks like an aerosol because it's humidified air that's going into the patient. 
The patient end, you may get secretions from the patient when that happens. But that's not aerosol. But they're not aerosol. Right. So you may get them on your clothing or you may get them on your hands, but then you can wash that off your hands and change your apron to, to remove that secretion that may have some virus in it. So this is sounding to me like life's suddenly got a lot simpler for me because all I need to really think about is wearing my FFP3 mask and goggles away from the bed space really just to stop myself being silly and rubbing my eyes and sticking my finger yeah. in my mouth by mistake because yeah. I've touched something. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as I wash my hands regularly between patients yeah. and I wear a plastic apron and I swap yeah. between patients, I'm not yeah. going to be picking stuff up and I'm not going to be transmitting Correct. it on. Yeah. And I can't really get it, so yeah. I'm, I'm pretty safe. Yeah. So the important thing to realise is that if you get it on your hands, you can wash it off with soap and water or alcohol. It's right. really easily removed from your hands. So where did all this stuff come from at gloves then? Because we all started taping yeah. up with gloves and double gloving. Yeah. And yeah. Is, is that necessary or is that just like for usual stuff, for body fluids, not transmitting poo yeah. and yeah. get together around? So for, for patients who are infectious with COVID, and that's something else that's worth thinking about in right. ITU, many of your patients or you've not. probably had in ITU for several weeks, and we are fairly certain now that they, you may find virus um, if you test it because the test is just looking for a bit of genome. Yeah, right. So it doesn't tell you that's live virus. They may still have bits of viral genome left, but they are no longer infectious and they're generally considered to be no longer infectious after right. three or four weeks. Sure. So you may have patients who are there because they had COVID, but they're no longer infectious. And right. at that point, we can downscale the infection control precautions. So with an infectious COVID patient, so when they're in the early stage of the disease within the first two to three weeks, then we would recommend wearing gloves and aprons, but just for direct contact with that patient. Right. So just for caring for them or handling their immediate bed area, we would recommend gloves and aprons, yeah. but it's really important that you take those off before you go and care so for anybody really, else. So this is really, though, what, when I think about it, this is what we were doing eight weeks ago, right? Yes. We would routinely wash our hands between patients, yes. put an apron on, yes. gloves if we're touching the patient, and yes. dispose of them, wash our hands before we meet yeah. the next patient. So yeah. actually we're just saying, do yeah. sensible, normal, normal common care. sense things yeah. that we would normally do. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's much more simple. Well, I mean, that sort of answers my next question, which was, if you've got gloves on, some people we heard were washing the alcohol yeah. Yeah. gel all over the gloves so they yeah. can keep the gloves on. Yeah. So, A, I guess we don't know for certain that works and that it doesn't no. degrade the glove. No. And secondly, it sounds like there's no point anyway. We no. Can, you know, we can just take those gloves off because they might carry something horrible. Yeah. And put another pair on when we need to. Absolutely. And of course, I, I think I can understand why it happened because because I think there's a tendency to think, oh, you mustn't get any virus on your skin. So you put the gloves on and cover your cuffs, but you can wash it off really easily. And because even if you if you'd put gloves on when you went in the unit, it's still really important that you change them between patients. So you're gonna to have to take them off right. and wash your hands. Well, look, this makes sense because it then also suggests that maybe a bit of mythology got in Yes. About this business yeah. of waterproof or water repellent. Yeah. Now, yeah. it seems to me that's very helpful if someone with Ebola has got torrential diarrhea and is spraying yes. blood. Yeah. With a disease, you can catch through the crack in a skin. Yeah. Whereas this isn't infectious, as far as we know, even no. from a stool. No. And we're not going to be coated in spray of some sort. And even yes. if we did, we can't get it that way anyway. So no. it's nice to have water repellent, but. Should I be really terrified if, if no. I can't? No. No. And it makes sense in an area where you're doing a lot of AGPs. Right. And actually, to be honest, that's really things like CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen, where you've actually got much more aerosol being generated. And then perhaps you could, it would be reasonable to use a gown to just cover your clothing. In fact, the amount of, of those droplet nuclei you get on your clothing is going to be fairly small and you've still got to get them from your clothing into your mucous membranes. Which brings us back to if you've got some eye protection stuff and Correct. some don't accident yes. and we wash our hands, then we're still that, fine. That is, going to, that is going to protect you. Yeah. So a gown, and you're right, it doesn't need to be waterproof unless you've got a patient where you are likely to get a lot of body fluid over yourself, which, you know, nine times out of ten, that isn't the case. And even then, I'm not going to get coronavirus that way anyway. No, you're not. Now, 
I have to say what I'm doing, but you can correct me, I may be wrong. We've got a sort of big central unit uh -huh. and a central workstation in the yeah. middle. Now, I'm putting my FFP3 on and my goggles because I'm going right next to patients the whole time mm -hmm. on ward rounds mm -hmm. and so forth. And when I'm going out to the middle area to type on a computer, I keep it on for the simple reason we discussed. So yeah. it, it stops me accidentally doing something yeah. silly to transmit. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense to do that? That's perfectly okay because the FFP3 is there to protect you right. from aerosols. You can have the discussion at some point um, as we go through this outbreak as whether that is necessary because if you don't have patients in the unit who have COVID or are infectious, then you could actually stop wearing FFP3 generally in the unit, but you need to make a risk assessment and about when you're at that point. three, four metres from the head of any bed and um, I had washed my hands very thoroughly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I chose to take off FFP3 mm -hmm. and goggles and wash my hands very thoroughly mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to bother to do that, I'm just kidding. But if I did, being in a central area, yep. that's not a risk either, really, no, is it? it isn't. Because, Except that I, yeah. Because if you think back to when you would do aerosol generating procedures with a patient who had influenza, for example, right. actually you would put on the FFP3 um, and the, the gown for doing that intubation or tracheostomy with a patient who you know has influenza right. or SARS. So once we're in a position where we know that we, we have a contained number of patients with COVID, that we can manage sensibly as this is an aerosol generating procedure, we try and do that in a discrete area so that only the people involved in the procedure actually wear the protective clothing. Um, but it will depend over time and it, it will fluctuate depending on how many patients you have. But your biggest risk is when you are close to that patient, within around two metres of that patient. That is when you are most likely to inhale the aerosols, if it's an AGP, and, and get it on your hands. Yeah, so it makes sense then if, if you know, you, every unit, I guess, can make its own call. Yeah. My personal feeling is if I've put my FFP3 mask on and my visor, it doesn't bother me during the day. Yeah. It's on, yeah. as long as I wash my hands regularly, it stops yeah. me doing something silly by mistake yeah. or touching the yeah. keyboard and then yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I guess talking about that, it makes sense when we are doing that, to do a little bit of housework and wipe the keyboard down and yeah. wipe down the surfaces. So the, the key thing about keyboards, and the, it applies to those sort of computer on wheels that right. everybody has now, all the central area where you have phones and computers, yeah. that I'm sure you see it all the time, that yeah. there's a lot of people sitting there and they've got gloves on and they're tapping on the keyboards or using the phone with their gloves on. And of course, yeah. because you've used gloves to touch the patient, the patient's environment, then you're just transferring the pathogens yeah. from the environment straight to those shared equipment. So it's really critical that the gloves are for use with the patient, the patient's environment, they're taken off, the hands are washed, because when you take gloves off, you very often contaminate your hands as you take them off. You wash your hands and you use the computer. When you've finished using the computer, you wash your hands again, because you can't really be certain the person who used it before has washed but their this hands. This is so reassuring, because this is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah. All we're doing is going, do what yeah. you normally do, folks, yeah. and it'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about the visitors? We've got still some patients needing proning, mm -hmm. and we've got these fabulous teams of anaesthetists and orthopods and others yeah. who come in. and. Yeah. They are right up close and personal. Yeah. They're yeah. turning. There's a chance yeah. that the ET tube might disconnect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does it make sense for them to be? They wear the full kit. Yeah, and I think for the moment, where you certainly where you have a patient who is a COVID patient, who you you think there is a chance they're still excreting mm. a, vi a viral virus, virus yeah. then it makes sense for the close contact they have that right. they protect more of their clothing. I think where it becomes an issue is. Obviously, if they go through a series of patients with that same clothing on, then there's a risk that they're going to transfer all sorts of other pathogens from one patient to another. Right. And so we always have to remember, whilst we're focusing on COVID, you have to think about what you normally see in ITU commonly. You, right. It's not uncommon to see multi-drug resistant pathogens no. because the patients are sick and you're giving them a lot of antibiotics. But those organisms will accumulate in the patient's bed area on the surface of their skin and actually, if you're just using the same uh, gown, Good. there's a risk you will transfer that. Good. And certainly with gloves, um, you can protect the gown with an apron, so that will protect the protoning team's gown for a large part that's in contact. But wherever possible, it, it is best practice to change any protective clothing between, between patients. patients. 
Okay, well, two fi- final questions before we sum up then. Um, f- next thing is funny hats. Funny hats. Right, yes. so um, pink, blue, any colour you like. Yeah. Do I need to wear a funny hat, a theatre no. hat or something? No, no, no. no. Um, so remember that these droplet nuclei, there's a few of them released during aerosol generating procedures, but not that many. Right. They'll settle um, onto all sorts of surfaces, but there really aren't very many. There might be the odd one or two that settle in your hair. But actually, human, the human microbiome has lots of enzymes that chew up that sort of viral particles. So it's not really going to survive on your hair for any length of time at all. And those flimsy little hair covers are not really going to achieve anything. If anything, what they'll do is go, just get just you to touch your hair off. with your glovey, dirty old hands. Oh, good. All right, so that's nice. Well, I'm not wearing them anyway, which is good. And the other bit is overshoes. Yes. Um, now, most of us are not licking the floor or dropping food and picking it up. So does it make much difference? I can wear my shoes and walk out. I expect I'll carry some coronavirus, but does that matter much? No, absolutely not. Because again, the number of particles that are going to be there is tiny, absolutely tiny. They don't survive for very long in the environment anyway, so it's not as though they've accumulated over the weeks. They, they They will die relatively quickly on surfaces such as that. Right. Um, but the worst thing about it is that if you put overshoes on and off, you're touching the floor and, you've got and your dirty to... old shoes. So you're going to get all sorts of other pathogens on your hands by touching the floor and taking your overshoes on and off. So they don't add anything to infection prevention and actually they just increase the risk that you're going to get contamination on your hands. Okay, so let's see, because I'm a bit slow at these things, um, let's see if I can sum up what I think makes sense and you can tell me if I've got it right. So when I approach my unit, which at the moment has a whole bunch we've got contained, it is COVID central still, or at least people have had COVID. I'm going to put my gown on because I'm going to wear it when I'm on the ward round. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put my FFP3 mask mm-hmm. on and I'm going to put my visor on. And that will stop me getting bits and bobs and aerosols if mm-hmm. I happen to be next to a patient, I have mm-hmm. to do a sudden bronch. Mm-hmm. But it also stops me accidentally rubbing my eyes, sucking my fingers, chewing my nails mm-hmm. or doing something else. Yeah. I'm good to wash my hands before yeah. I go into patient bay yeah. and I'm going to put on a plastic apron. Yeah. And when I leave that bay, I'm going to take the apron off mm-hmm. and I'm going to wash my hands again. Mm-hmm. And if I'm going to touch the patient where I might get bodily fluids mm-hmm. n- with nothing to do with coronavirus, but just for common mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. I'm going to wear a pair of gloves yep. and I'm going to dispose of those mm-hmm. and wash my hands as I always would. Absolutely. That sounds well, fantastic. This is, okay, this is so much simpler. Thank you very much. Okay. My Thank pleasure. You.